Good morning. How are you all doing? Good. Good. Excellent. So those of you who have registered for 400 or 500 uh, seminar, you must sign at the back. There's a paper that Stephen is having. If you are Sam Burden and uh, Steve is telling you to sign it, don't listen to him. I saw that Steve was telling Sam to sign it. So I'm uh, happy to welcome one of the rising stars and uh, excellent uh, interdisciplinary professors in the campus, um, Bing Benton Brunton here today. She's going to talk to us about the sparse dynamical models of big neural data. So reading from a little bit of her abstract before introducing her. Understanding the brain and its function is one of the grand challenges in modern science. Human brain has 86 billion neurons where each neuron talks to about a thousand other neurons. The complexity of this system far exceeds all other natural or engineered systems. Within this massive, dynamic, and remarkably robust network arises sensation, action, thoughts, feelings, and the capacity to wonder what makes itself tick. You are doing it right now. So Bing's research work addresses the problem of the massive data that is being generated and cannot be processed by our current systems. How do you understand, go further, and then make it viable for people to continue to understand the system, reduce it, and develop tools for managing our brain in some sense. We have a neural center funded by CS, uh, NSF, ERC. I don't know if she is part of it, at least uh, one of my neighbors, Tom Daniel, and some of the professors here are involved in it. We said, uh, this is an interesting topic, not only for our department, it's an interesting to topic across the campus. There's also a program on neuro engineering in these systems. So now coming to Bing's background, she is a Washington Research Foundation Innovation Assistant Professor in Neuroengineering at the University of Washington, Department of Biology. She is also a Data Science Fellow of the UW eScience Institute and a faculty member of the graduate program in neuroscience. She holds a BS in biology from Caltech and a PhD in neuroscience from Princeton. Her research interests combine data-driven analytical te analytic techniques and ideas from dynamical systems to understand big, complex data measuring neural activity. Her research also cuts across beyond neural because this is fundamental to a large collection of systems called cyberphysical systems. So I'm not only excited to invite her on behalf of the department, personally I'm really glad that she is here to give a talk. Please welcome her for the talk. Thank you, Ratha, for the very kind introduction. Um, I'm thrilled to be here to talk to you all today. Um, and uh, so I'll start by, by talking a little bit about what's been happening in the news recently. So this is a New York Times article that came out, I think, uh, earlier in September this year. Uh, and, and it caused this whole, I mean, I, tons of people were like sending me emails about it, talk, talking to me about it. It was like, oh, there's this thing, there's this, there's this young woman who was dying and she's having her brain frozen in hopes that in the future, uh, we'll revise her by reading out the connectomas of her brain and, and she'll come back to life, maybe in silico or something like that. Is this really possible? Um, and and it, was, it was just really, it was really ridiculous to me that this was a New York Times article because there was almost no science in it. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to get across to you today is the, is the complexity of the brain um, as well as uh, why it is that, that, that this is just, it's just not science. Um, and so, so in response to this, I found this recently, um, Ken Miller, who is the co-director of the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience at Columbia University, wrote this opinion piece a couple of, a couple of days ago, I think it was published last Sunday, in response to uh, this whole thing about freezing your brain. Um, and uh, you can go read it if you want, it's very well written. Um, and he makes a really very straightforward point by point argument about uh, why freezing your brain is probably not a viable way to try to live forever. 
Um, and I'll try, to, I'll try to reiterate some of these points as well, um, because it really not only is, is, is interesting, but it really gets to the heart of this deep scientific problem of how the brain functions um, and how we can analyze it at different levels of description in order to come to an understanding of how it works. So if you stop paying attention after the slide, here is a summary of what I'm going to tell you about today. All right, here's my, here's my rat. He's my, he had a photo shoot. He's very cute. So the first thing I'm going to tell you about is that the brain is cool. The brain is really awesome. I'm rather attached to mine. I'm going to keep it. Um, so the second is that the brain is dizzyingly complex. And I'll tell you exactly what I mean by that. It is just staggering. Every time I try to think about it, it makes me really feel fortunate to be in this field, to be studying the brain at this time. I think we're at a really exciting time in this field where all the tools, both technical and infrastructure, as well as analytic, are coming together so that we're really able to make some progress in this very important problem. And neuroscience, uh, first of all, it's doing lots of things, but one of the things it's doing is acquiring a staggering amount of data. And so the data is both wonderful as well as poses a lot of challenges, opportunities. And one of the first ones is, well, what do we even do with it? How do we keep it? How do we curate it? How do we understand what's going on with it? How do we share it with each other so more of us are able to dig through it? And the second one uh, is after we've dug through it, it and, and kept it is, what does it all mean, right? This is incredibly complex data we're going to be talking about. And uh, the last one, which is, uh, is uh, something that I'm actively working on in my lab, is this idea of well, what, what happens if we poke it, right? This is not a passive system. We don't just get to sit there and look at it. We also get to manipulate it in certain ways. And so what happens if we poke it? That's the last part of the talk. These are the three parts that I'm going to be talking about. All right. Uh, please feel free to, to raise your hand and ask questions at any point. Uh, I don't care to get to the end of my slides. I would much rather have a conversation with you. So, so please uh, don't feel shy to interrupt if you have a question. Okay. So to start, what I'd like to do uh, is give you a sense of the, the scale of the problem. Okay? So let's back up a little bit and talk about brains in general. Here's a nice figure of a couple of different kinds of mammalian brains. And um, they're not all the same scale bars. The scale bar actually changes throughout this figure. So you can kind of see the differences in sizes from a really small rodents to the human brain down here. The human brain um, has 86 billion neurons, as far as we can tell. So if I could get everyone to make two fists, make two fists. Put your two fists together. That is the size of your brain. Look at it. That's how big it is. So the bigger the hand, the bigger the brain. <laughs> Approximately. We're talking order and magnitude here. <laughs> um, and it usually surprises me um, how, how small it is, right? Because if you think about it, it's like, I feel like my head's kind of big, right? And this is not that big. And really, there's a lot of bone. There's fluids. This lower half here is just all draw and digestive stuff. And so the, your brain is this big, OK? And if you look at it, the first thing you see is it's wrinkly. The wrinkles are folds in um, the outermost layer of the brain called the neocortex, right? And they're folds because it's too big in area. And so if you take something that's too big in area and try to squish it onto a small ball, it gets wrinkly. That's what the wrinkles are, right? And if you took the neocortex off, you peeled it off and ironed it, you're going to get something that's about the size of a large dinner napkin. That's the size of your neocortex. And it does have three-dimensional structure, but it's not that thick. It's about two millimeters thick. And so it has this uh, interesting structure where it sort of computes in 3D, but it's not exactly 3D, but it also computes in area as well. Okay, uh, Matt, do you have a credit card on you? <laughs> now, what's the number up? I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so this, now all of you have one of these in your pocket, right? This is the size of your visual, of your primary visual cortex. It's almost exactly this, this size, all right? It's about two millimeters thick. It's about this much in area. And if you folded it up and tucked it into the back of your brain right here, that's the size of your visual cortex, right? I'll give it back to you in a second. Um, thank you. Um, and, and so, so if you can that give you some context, right? So, so this is how things, this is how big things are, right? And inside the human brain, there's 86 billion neurons. There's approximately the same number of cells that are not neurons in your brain. They do housekeeping functions like, you know, keep your neurons alive, that kind of thing. Uh, take away the trash, feed you oxygen, uh, feed you glucose, so that everything works. Um, and every neuron makes approximately on the order again on the order of a, of a thousand connections. And these connections are made more likely to be with local neurons rather than the neurons that are far away. So it has sort of the small world connectivity structure as well. Okay. Now, we've looked for a long time as neuroscientists to find what's special about the human brain. Okay. Um, and one of the first things you can see, well, it's kind of, it looks like it's actually kind of bigger than all of these other ones, but, but that's not true. Um, we don't have the biggest brain. The African elephant has a larger brain. I don't have a picture of a whale brain. I suspect it's quite large. 
Um, we don't have the brain that has the largest number of neurons. There are, again, other mammals that have um, brains that are not necessarily bigger but have more neurons in it. Um, and the list goes on and on. We've tried to measure all kinds of things to try to find, to quantify what is special about the human brain, because clearly we all feel, I mean, I feel I'm special. I don't know if you feel like you're special. So we feel like we're special. We feel like our brains are special, but, but it's been really hard to quantify. The cells don't look all that different. The connectivity doesn't look terribly different. It's not the white matter. It's not the size of this lobe or that lobe. And so we're still trying to find what it is about our brains that's special. And um, in one of the books that I read that was pretty influential, my, my thinking about, about cognition um, is uh, this neuroscientist, Michael Kazanica, described it as being some kind of phase change, right? So, so, so in the course of evolution, um, there's relatively continuous changes. For example, all the, all the primates have related like-looking brains, and that sometime something just crossed some kind of bifurcation point and it snapped. And, and we have something that's qualitatively different because we've done qualitatively different things to our planet that other primates have not managed to do. So there's something, there's something there, and it may or may not be something we can put our fingers on, but there's something really special about the brain, and we'd like to be able to understand it. Um, but unfortunately, and I've already highlighted a little bit of this in the previous um, vignette about the New York Times article, this is what popular science sees as the brain, okay? There's all sorts of these pictures. Anytime that there's anything about the brain, Alzheimer's or whatever in the news, they have this picture of the brain. And it's this wonderful, beautiful thing. It looks really clean. There's these lightning flashes of inspiration that are crossing the brain, and it's really exciting. And, and unfortunately, this, this, this picture of the brain is, is inaccurate in almost every single way. Uh, the brain is not empty space like this. Not all the neurons are, um, that, well, first of all, there's many more of them. They're not all identical like this. And, 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 and you know, we've known about this kind of thing for a really long time. Over 100 years ago, Ramon Nicolhal carefully looked through the microscope and, uh, and looked at the, the, the heterogeneity of these cell types and drew pictures of circuits and really was able to, 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 to jumpstart the, the modern study of neuroscience in a real way. He's sometimes thought of as the, as the father of modern neuroscience. Um, and so from this, we've been inspired to try to answer some, some really deep questions about structure and function. How is it that the different kinds of neurons contribute to their different function, right? So the modern iteration of this kind of work is called connectomics, where people go in uh, with really large machines and a lot of computational power and a lot of time and try to look at uh, how we can reconstruct these neural circuits. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a block, just a volumetric block of a mouse brain. So the, the height there is probably about a, a millimeter and a half, right, and there's a little block of it. And they've gone in with uh, what's called serial block scanning electron microscopy, which basically means that they, they do SEM, right, and then they take a really, really tiny knife and they slice off a tiny piece of it and they do it again, and they slice it again, right? This gets you across some of the, um, the registration problems between slices, because so, you're always, you're also slicing it off the top. Um, so you see this block, and it looks nothing like the previous picture, right? This is a real brain, right? It's messy, there's all sorts of stuff in it. Those giant holes, the circles in it, those are the blood vessels because you need to feed the brain, the brain needs blood, okay? And if you zoom in, it looks like this, right? So this is a more zoomed in figure, um, and uh, if you don't know what you're looking at, it's hard, to, it's hard to know you're looking at anything in particular. It does have some structure, but it's really hard to see what's going on, right? So the brain is it's full of stuff. The cells are right next to each other, there's no empty space. Um, you have things like mitochondria, which are feeding this, these cells with energy. You have, uh, th those black arrows are pointing at synapses, which are uh, what we call the connections between two different neurons. And each of those synapses, uh, if you look at the scale bar down there, is on the order of one micron large, okay? For comparison, an entire microorganism, like an E. coli bacterium, is one micron large. So these synapses, which are small parts of these neurons, and there's thousands and thousands of them in every single neuron, has about the complexity of an entire bacterium. It's a whole city of infrastructure. There's at least a thousand different proteins that are uh, coordinated with each other. They vary in size and function and shape, and there's dynamic activity inside every single one of those black arrow pointed synapses. And so that's the level of complexity we're talking about at the microscopic level. But one of the things that makes studying neuroscience really difficult is that there is multi-scale structure in space across massive orders of magnitude of size. Okay, so on the left-hand side, we have um, size in uh, log coordinates in millimeters. So on the very bottom, we have a synapse, which is um, what we looked at in the SEM earlier. So the synapse has, I mean, there's whole fields, not just labs, whole fields studying just the protein cascades of the synapse alone, right? 
and there's complicated biophysical models that have been made on single synapses and the computation they do because they're, they're dynamic, right? They're not static structures, um, and uh, they, they change the function of time as well as their activity. And going up in time, we have dendrites, which are those little spindly things that we see in the cells. There's, uh, there's different neurons that have different structures. Over there is a drawing um, by Ramon Cajal, which is what a cerebellum, a cerebellar neuron, which is really, really quite pretty. And they're highly ordered and highly structured and have this fractally structure, which is really cool to look at. Beyond that, there's layers. So there's layers of your cortex, right? So within these two millimeters, there's about five or six layers of neurons that have distinct um, shapes and functions. And going up to that, we have nuclei, which are clumps of cells. We have lobes. So the your septal lobe down here is uh, back here is your visual lobe. So there's lobe lobe organization. Um, and then we have the brain, and then we have the body. And so in order to understand what's going on, we have to not only study and describe each of these scales or description of the nervous system, we have to actually connect them somehow, right? And that's a really, really big challenge. Um, but if that's not complicated enough, we also have multi-scale dynamics in time. So in addition to multi-scale uh, multi structures in space, we have multi-scale dynamics in time. And so in the bottom here, what we have is, again, orders of magnitudes of dynamics in time, going from milliseconds to days, to months, to years, to decade. And here are just some examples of things that have dynamics on these time scales. Um, the, one of the fundamental units of neural computation is an action potential, and action potential is a, is a, is a punctal voltage change across the, the membrane of the cell, and it lasts on the order of a millisecond. It varies, but it's about a millisecond. Um, and then you have uh, synaptic plasticity, so these synapses change. Um, you have neuromodulation by serotonin and dopamine. So these are small molecules that will modulate your activity on the, on, on the order of you know, tens of milliseconds to seconds. And we have uh, short-term memory, sensation, emotion, speech, right? Um, and on order of seconds, we get to decision making. How do you make snap decisions about if you want to buy an orange or an apple? Or less, or less trivial decisions like which graduate school to apply to, for example. Um, and then there's also seasonality, there's circadian rhythms, there's neurogenesis, even in adults. So even during your adulthood in your 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, there's brand new neurons being born inside your brain and being crawling around your brain and being incorporated into the existing neural circuitry and trying to find their function. So that's changing throughout your lifetime. Um, and then of course, there's long-term learning and memory. And these are the things that you accumulate throughout your lifetime that to some, to a large extent, define who you are, right? Because all those single molecules, they get recycled. Any single protein inside your brain doesn't stick around for all that long. It degrades, um, it gets taken out, and a different piece that's not exactly identical gets put back in, right? And so by the time that you've lived for a couple of decades long, the number of molecules that actually remain from your childhood is very small, but still you, you remain the same person. You feel like you're the same person. There's some continuity there. You remember being a child even though none of those molecules that were present when you were a child were actually there anymore. And so capturing all of these multi-scale dynamics is something that's really important in understanding the brain. Um, and so I'll just highlight here one of these figures that I, that I stole from a um, review article um, that was published recently by Nature Neuroscience. They did, a, um, they did a, like a whole issue featuring big data and neuroscience. And so in this figure, what um, Terence Sanowski and his colleagues did was try to summarize in one figure, what are the current technologies that we have to measure brain activity? So these are the same two axes that we had in the last two slides. On the vertical axis, we have a log coordinates of, of, of size scale. On the horizontal axis, we have log coordinates of, um, of time scale. And so each of those little, of those little fuzzy um, rounded rectangles is a distinct type of technique that we have to measure neuroactivity at that size scale to at that, at that time scale, okay? It's not exhaustive, there's more stuff here. It, it, I think it's slightly misleading because this figure makes it look like we've got it all pretty much well covered, and that's just not really true. Um, um, but nevertheless, I think the point here is that um, technology has been going at a staggering pace, and we now have tons and tons of tools for measuring neuroactivity. And, um, and so, so that's, that, that's sort of the challenge for me, right? Like I work with uh, big data and neuroscience of various kinds, and so, so when I see this, what I see is these people have a problem, right? They are t capturing tons and tons of large dimensional time series information and dumping it into hard drives, and then what do we do with it, right? Um, and so I'll just give you one example 
of, a, of, of one particular data set that's pretty cool along these veins. So this is a, um, this is done by Misha Aaron's lab, Janelia Farm, uh, which is a Howard Hughes Medical Institute lab in, in Ashburn, Virginia. And what he's done is he's now able to measure the uh, neuroactivity from every single neuron inside an entire brain of a vertebrate. So this is a larval zebrafish. It's really small and it happens to be transparent, which is fantastic. And so what he does is he goes in and uh, using a sheet laser, he can probe the activity of every single neuron inside this brain. There's about 100,000 of these. And, and he can look at what they're doing at a resolution of about a second or one, one and a half seconds, which is pretty impressive. Um, and again, they just get, they get reams and reams and reams of data off of this. Um, and there's so much data here um, that one of his collaborators, Jeremy Freeman, also at Genelia Farms, is actually starting to look at um, large scale cluster computing tools that he's taken from, from the industry to try to analyze this data. Because even doing something simple like, um, you know, just taking an average or, or looking at a trace of what's happening in every trial becomes kind of difficult when you have, when you have this staggering amount of data. Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of public initiatives, both private and public, um, uh, both in the US and across the world, to try to capture more data and then just put it on the internet. And so this is fantastic news for me since my lab is not a net generator of data. <laughs> I don't have rigs. Um, and so I rely on uh, both excellent collaborators as well as these publicly available open sources of data to do research. Um, and so Obama's brain initiative um, has been in the news recently and uh, DARPA has also invested heavily into some of these technologies to try to both fund um, measuring more neural data as well as putting it out on the internet in a publicly available way that's useful for other researchers. The Allen Institute for Brain Science, which is right down the street here in Fremont, although they're moving to South Lake Union recently, has been a really a leader in this field as well, where um, their entire mission is to just collect more data, collect really good data, and then put it out there for free on the internet for anyone to use. Um, and so if any of you, especially students, if you, if you ever have a, have a course project or something and you, you're looking around for some, a really cool data set, look, look up some of these sources. The Allen Brain Institute's um, website has a, has a lot of tools and, and they also have APIs and different things that you, can, that, you, that you can do to get started really quickly doing some of these course projects um, using cool ne neuroscience data. Um, there's also the Human Brain Project, which is a European initiative. There's Human Connectome Project, which is looking at the human brain connectome, not on a neuron by neuron level, but kind of on the, the brain area by brain area level. And this is not exhaustive. There's lots and lots of resources out there. Um, and I had to put this next slide up because this just came out in Cell a couple of days ago. So Henry Markram is, the, uh, is, the, is kind of the architect of the European Blue Brain Project who's come across a lot of flack recently because his idea was that we're just going to build a massive simulation of the human brain and that will solve all of our problems. Um, I'll keep my opinions of that to myself. But <laughs> they published this paper a couple of days ago where they, they've succeeded in, in accomplishing this at a smaller scale by, by simulating, they claim, a small piece of mouse tissue. And so this is, this is actually not data, this is simulation data of, of what they have. Um, and, so, and so I guess, Implicit in part of this philosophy and this approach to studying neuroscience and studying how the brain works in this way is that we need detailed information, right? We need to know precisely where every cell is. We need to know precisely who connects to whom, what they're talking about, and we need detailed biophysical models of every single tiny little part of the brain, and that's how we're going to answer these questions. Um, and to me, that just, you know, I, I would not take that approach, and I am not taking that approach. And I'll tell you a little bit of why I don't think that's the right approach. So. I guarantee you right now, if I take any one of you, all right, and I can just magically snap my finger and I can kill a single cell in your brain, you will not know. You'll be just fine. In fact, I'll give a little further. I can probably take away a small part of your brain, a small little piece of it, and just, you know, again, snap my finger, it'll just be gone, and you'll be just fine. Right? We have lots and lots of cases of this. Um, I've done experiments in, in, um, in rodents where we do these massive, massive lesions, and you take out large chunks of their brain, you sew them back up, they recover for a few days, and you know what, they're okay afterwards. You'd have to try really hard to find the deficit, be a really clever, clever design a really clever task to, to find a way that, that they're no longer behaving like they used to be. Um, and so a particularly striking case of this, um, is this is something that was, that was just like, I couldn't believe my eyes when I first saw this. So, so this man on the left here is a French civil servant who went to the hospital in 2007 complaining that one of his legs or arms was kind of numb. And so the doctors do an MRI, and here's, 
his brain on the left there, and he basically doesn't have one, all right? So he has, he suffers from one of these disorders where, um, so in comparison, there's a typical brain on the, on the right-hand side, and so you have these structures, um, if I can get my cursor, well, anyway, so I'll just point with my hand. Um, so you see this little gray uh, curve thing right there, that's called a ventricle, we all have them, it's a, it's a small fluid-filled chamber inside your brain. So he had a condition where basically the fluid in his ventricle was being pumped in, but it wasn't being sucked out. Okay? And so over the course of decades, his ventricle was enlarged to the extent where it took over his entire brain. Right? His entire, the inside cavity of his brain was basically one gigantic fluid-filled ventricle, and it was squeezing all of the rest of his brain out. Um, in the words of one of the physicians I was looking at this, th th this condition seems to be incompatible with life. Yet not a, is it compatible with life. He was, he was okay, you know, he, he, he worked as a civil servant in France. He was social. He had a family, uh, he was married, you can talk to him, he seemed okay. Um, he had an IQ of, 80, of, of 75, which is not genius levels, but he's not considered mentally retarded, and this, this person is okay with this, right? So our brain is remarkably robust. It can take a lot of beating and still be okay, and I think this is, this is a key to our understanding of how the brain works, which is there is a right level of description for understanding the brain, and it may not be understanding every tiny little detail everywhere, right? So at some point we do, we have to connect these levels of understanding, but to do what we want to do, especially to try to affect change, to try to help people who are suffering from different kinds of neurological disorders, maybe we don't need to understand every tiny thing. And for me, this is a helpful thing. This is a, this is a hopeful message. It makes, it makes me feel like maybe I'm actually able to do something because the staggering complexity of the system sometimes feels like it would be too much. It's almost hopeless, but I don't think it is, right? Because of this guy here. Um, if I had to bet, they are, uh, they're hopefully trying to, um, you know, get access to his brain eventually. Uh, <laughs> so, in terms of what does it all mean, I'll just reiterate some of the challenges. Um, the, the measurements we have are big and noisy. This is always a challenge. This is not a challenge only in neuroscience, but in all different kinds of fields of natural and, um, and, and, and biological and engineering sciences where we acquire measurements from real space, from, from, from the real world, and they come out big and noisy. Um, furthermore, unlike physical systems, uh, we have no governing equations, okay? Um, some people, there, there are certain levels of description where people have written down different, different dynamical systems where they feel like it maybe describes what's happening in a, at a small scale, but, but I think we're coming to the feeling that for neural computation, there's no governing equations, and it's, there's nothing we can even say at a very, very small scale that we can go back down there and say, okay, this is the ground truth. But, and this is hopeful for me, there may be governing dynamics, okay? So I'm gonna try to use this in the course of my research to try to get some leverage on the data and the computation of the brain. Um, yes? What is the difference between the two? Can you explain governing equation or the governing dynamics? So, uh, the, so the question was, what's the difference between governing equations and governing dynamics? And it's an excellent question. I'm, I'm being sort of loose with my terminology here, so I hope you don't, uh, you'll forgive me a little bit. Um, I, I, so so by, by, by governing equations, I mean something like F equals MA, right? Like you can go to a brand new system, something you've never seen before, a green hairy ball in outer space or whatever, and you don't know anything about it, you kind of say, okay, I, I think I know something about it because I think I know physics. We don't have that in neuroscience, right? But there are patterns in the data. And that's what I mean by governing dynamics, right? There's these patterns at different temporal scales, um, and if we can, we can find these temporal patterns, I think we can get a handle on some of the computations that are going on. So that's a little loose, but I hope that's a little bit clarifying. Thanks for the question. Okay, so we have uh, multi-scale structures in space and time, um, and one of the big challenges is connecting these different levels of description. I think it would be insufficient to take data at any scale and describe the brain only at that scale, but rather what we need to do is have, uh, have, have levels of description both at the, the behavior and motor output, and then brain areas, and then within each brain area, and then ultimately down to the, to the cells and the synapses. Um, but that's sort of a, that's sort of a longer term challenge. Um, and so then and, and the last thing, which I think is something I'm just starting to get into a little bit more, is this idea of naturalistic and multimodal data. Right? We don't just have brain data, we actually have access to a lot of other types of data. We have video data, we have audio data, uh, we have depth data. And it is unclear what we've all learned from these um, traditional neuroscience experiments where typically you have the person sitting there and you're like, you're doing a particular task and you're looking at their brain, their brain's doing a particular task. And um, 
what happens if you just set them out into the field? We don't, we don't usually do those kinds of experiments as neuroscientists. And I think the technology now is just about right that we are able to do those experiments. And so I think that's pretty exciting. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so, so what do I do? I, I work with stuff that looks like that, okay? So uh, what you're seeing is the, uh, the brain activity of a particular human um, where on the horizontal axis is time. Here's a couple of seconds worth of data. We could easily acquire hours or days of this stuff. Every single trace is one electrode in the brain and uh, the vertical axis is voltage. And I've just stacked them so you can actually see the individual electrodes. Um, and you can see that, uh, well, it's messy, it's noisy, um, but there's, it's, it's not completely absent of patterns, right? You can see that there's oscillations at certain frequencies that are more prevalent than others. Um, and you can see that there's transient dynamics and you can see that there's certain groups of electrodes that seem to be doing the same thing at the same time. And so, so are, are, there are some lower, lower dimensional patterns in this data. Um, so I am a biologist. I have to show you at least one bloody gory picture. So if this is bothers you, please close your eyes. Here it is, all right. This data is uh, from a human patient. So here is an open human skull um, where they've taken away the skull and they've kind of peeled back. Some of that white stuff is, uh, is dura tissue. And those dots, each single one of those dots is a, a small electrode that's stinging on the surface of the brain that's collecting this data. Um, and so the data I'm talking about comes from uh, Jeff Ogeman's lab. He is a neurosurgeon down here in, uh, at UW. And he's been very, very supportive of you know, people like me using the data that he's gathered through his lab to further science. Um, I think he's just supportive of, um, of, of just, you know, not only sharing data in a limited way, but also other people um, kind of digging into the data because I think he recognizes that it's more than he can do by himself, which, for which I'm very grateful. Um, and so, yes? How long did you guys uh, take this data for? How long did we take this data for? So the, the scale of this particular slide is approximately, it's a couple of seconds, I don't remember exactly what. But um, so what I'll get to later is that these patients are actually in the hospital for a couple of weeks being continuously monitored. So the data is being acquired at about two kilohertz, 24-7 uh, weeks. Yeah, yep. Um, so longer, so longer would, would be starts being, they take it out after a couple of weeks uh, exactly for that, for that reason. Um, for other purposes, these, these grids have been left inside the brain for much longer, like years, although, yeah, at, the, at, at a couple of years, it'll almost certainly get infected because there's a wire sticking out, right? And that's not good. So there's another question down here. So are these people medical patients for ha and having that for medical reasons? Yes. Or like a volunteer Thank you for that? asking. Yeah, he said the question was, are these people medical patients? And absolutely. Uh, we don't do this for science. These are all done for clinical reasons. What typically happens is that these patients um, are suffering from epilepsy. Um, and lots and lots of cases of epilepsy are well controlled by medication. A small percentage of them are not, um, and they're intractable, so they end up in Jeff Ogeman's office, um, and they end up going, um, going under the knife to do um, epilepsy monitoring. So the clinical purpose of these electrodes is to localize the focus of the epileptic seizure so that they can figure out where, th there's usually one particularly small piece of tissue that's causing the seizure, so they can localize where it is, map the areas around it, make sure they, their approach of cutting it out doesn't take away any of your vital functions. Um, and then they do that over the course of a couple of weeks. And at the end of the couple of weeks, they take the electrodes out and go in and try to excise that little piece of tissue that was causing the problem. So we don't have access to, we, we can't control where the electrodes go, right? <laughs> uh, we get what we get. Sometimes they end up in weird places, but these are all done for clinical purposes. So yeah. Was there another question down there? Does the majority, or does the majority of your data come from stuff like this? Um, so what I'm talking about today, yes, my, the majority of the data I'm talking about today comes from this type of data, yeah. But there's um, obviously, as you probably suspect, lots and lots of animal research going on as well. Um, similar technology, different purposes. Um, I think there's something pretty cool about just looking at human data, just for the sake of looking at human data, just kind of see how different it is from our understanding of, of animal brains, which is much more substantial in detail. Um, so, yeah. But is it any, is it problematic that, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. these brains have a defect in them? Yeah, yeah, we think, uh, so, so the question was whether or not it's problematic that these brains have a defect in them. Um, yeah, that's something we're very careful about um, and we think about pretty carefully. 
Um, and one of the things uh, is considerations, that it's not like these brains have a defect in, in every way. They have a defect in a specific way that we can quantify. They have, these are epileptic brains, but they tend to have seizures. And so these have well-known effects on the brain in certain areas, but not others. And so we, we tried to restrict the scientific questions we asked in the realm of, of things that where you know, these people are more or less doing okay, right? We try, but it's not always possible. Yeah. Yes? So do patients like you said they have epilepsy or things of the like, would that skew your data sets at all? So the question is whether or not the fact that all of our data is coming from epilepsy patients skews the data. Yes, it must, right? Like there's no way for it not to skew the data. Um, it's a case of this is what we got and nobody has anything better, right? Um, and so the ways that we combat that are anytime we do any kind of behavioral study where we're asking these patients to do a particular task, um, we compare their behavior to uh, normal, typical humans, right? So can they do this task in a certain way? And is it the same way that a person who is not suffering from epilepsy does it the same way? So we can do those kinds of controls, right? So we can try to say, at least on the functional level, these brains are functioning in the context of a specific task in a way that is, that is commensurate with a, you know, your brains or mine, for example. Um, so yeah, it is skewed, and there's no way to do any better, so we just have to be cognizant of it. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, so one of the ways that I have been trying to understand this type of data, um, and I'll just show you, is by um, doing spatial temporal motor decomposition. So I'll show you what that means. So here's a really simple data set. Uh, I made up this movie, so I know exactly what's happening. So this is a movie that's 80 pixels by 80 pixels. So it technically has 6,400 dimensional data. And it changes in time, right? You look at it, it's not that complicated. There's two things happening, right? And we can all see it very, very clearly with our human eyes and our human brains, right? So there is a, a circle that's kind of fading in and out in the background. And there's also a square that's fading in and out at a different frequency, and they're overlapping, okay? So the, so the goal here is, in concept, that we want to separate these two things that are happening, right? That's the goal. Um, so what do we do when we want to separate out two different patterns in high-dimensional data? Well, what's the first thing that you would do? Say again? Show one, then the other. Is show, show, okay, so this is the data you're collecting, and you don't actually know what's going on, and you want to reduce the dimensionality of the data. What's your favorite dimensionality reduction tool? Findings that are orthogonal to each other, very good. So in other words, we do an SVD or a PCA, right? Okay, so I do a PCA, and here's what I got, right? It finds two dimensions, but the two objects that I want to find are overlapping. So I haven't actually separated them. All I've done is find a low dimensional basis in which all of the dynamics are occurring. So that's good. So the next thing I might do, and this is something that a lot of neuroscientists do, is called independent components analysis. So ICA, instead of PCA, which assumes that there's um, basically a high dimensional Gaussian distribution, um, assumes that, does not have the Gaussian assumption. It assumes that uh, there's some kind of statistical independence in the information theoretical point of view between the two different dimensions. And, and you can see that ICA does better than PCA, right? I've actually separated out the, the, cir um, the, the square from the circle, right? But the circle is really noisy and it still has a shadow of a square in it. So that's not great. Um, so what I'm gonna be talking about here is something called dynamic mode decomposition. So DMD not only separates out the two objects that are in the movie very cleanly, it also gives you their underlying frequencies of oscillation, okay? So to make an analogy here, uh, what I'm saying is that if PCA and the 4A transform got married and had a cute little baby, but that's DMD, okay? So I did not invent DMD. DMD came out of the fluid dynamics literature. People have been using it to, um, for the last, you know, not that long actually, it first came out in 2009, um, to analyze vector fields that are downstream of some kind of, uh, you know, fluid past a certain thing. Um, and so for biologists, I see this, right? So there's a fish and it's swimming and we can analyze the vector field flows past its tail by using something like DMD. Um, but really, it's a really general technique. It's just a numerical technique, um, and it doesn't assume anything about fluids. So I'll go through how it works really quickly. So you take snapshots of data uh, in time, and you vectorize every snapshot, right? So you get these columns of data, which are x at time zero, x at time one, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I construct that into a large data matrix I'm gonna call x, and then I'm gonna construct another data matrix y, which is exactly the same as x, except shifted over by one dt. Okay, so they have this column-wise relationship where every column in X relates to every column in Y by one dt. 
And I'm going to make the assumption that y equals ax, where a is a square matrix that has the same dimensions as the number of states that I'm measuring from. And so what I want to do is find the eigen decomposition of a, right? Because that's going to tell me all the dynamics. That's going to tell me how the system is evolving as a discrete time dynamical system, right? But I don't actually want to compute a, and I don't, definitely don't want to compute the eigen decomposition of a, because this data could be very, very large. It could be a billion different states, right? So if I have a billion measurements in time, then A is a billion by a billion. I don't want to compute that matrix. Now, fortunately, oftentimes, even when we have really high dimensional systems, these systems are not actually dense, right? They have sparse dynamics and they have low dimensional patterns in it. And so we use a trick to compute the DMD by taking advantage of the SVD and projecting all the data onto a truncated SVD basis so that we can then rotate this basis to find the, 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 find the basis vectors where instead of being orthogonal like in, in DMD, like an orthonormal basis, um, each basis is now dynamically coherent. So each direction now is actually oscillating at a coherent frequency and or decaying and growing exponentially at a coherent, at a coherent rate, right? Um, so it doesn't matter exactly how the math is. All I wanted to show there is that it's actually shockingly simple. It's literally four or five lines of linear algebra. Um, and what you get are eigenvalues, which tell you about grow and decay, and DMD modes, which tell you about spatial correlations between the measurements. So these are literally spatial modes and temporal modes, and they're coupled, they come in pairs, right? Um, and using it, we can write something that is like a dynamical systems model, right? So it's literally a function of T, where I take my matrix of um, modes phi, and I take my diagonal matrix of eigenvalues lambda and raise it to the power t, right? There's no integration going on here. I'm just taking a bunch of numbers and raising it to the power t. Um, and so applying this to brain data, so again, I have electrodes and brain data on top, what we can do is use a window technique to, 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 to perturb, to, to, uh, to ask what are the spatial structures that are active at certain frequencies at this time in all the electrodes that I have. Right. And so I'm using this technique to um, look at a particular system. So I worked on this project um, with Lise Johnson, who is one of Jeff Ojeman's um, postdocs, as well as the education coordinator for the Center, Center for Sensory Neural, Sensory Motor Neuroscience, Neuroengineering, I can say it. Um, and so what Lise and I looked at was, uh, was sleep. Okay? So, so you probably all have heard about REM sleep at some point, right? REM sleep is sort of a, one of the stages of sleep, but there's these other four stages of sleep, and you actually go through them in order. So when you fall asleep, you go through stage one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then REM, and all the way back. And for a typical human, this happens like every hour and a half or so, okay? Um, and so something that, it, that is really diagnostic of uh, stage two sleep are these objects called spindles. And they're transient oscillations, usually half a second to two seconds in duration, that are around 14 hertz. Okay, we've known about spindles for a really long time. Um, what we have not known is their, their spatial distribution, right? Because usually these are done with um, extra, extra skull electrodes, where you don't get very good spatial resolution. Um, and so we wanted to look at these spindle networks inside the brain by looking at the, the, the kind of data I was talking to you about before, where you have the electrodes directly on the brain surface. Um, and so we developed some techniques using both DMD as well as machine learning to uh, look at these networks. Um, and so here's some examples of these networks. Um, again, we have electrodes and time. And uh, the color code there tells you about the intensity of the mode or the intensity of the spindle network. And we can project this back onto electrode space and look at where the spindles are. And so here they are for, for one patient and here they are for, for a different patient. Um, and what you can see here is that we've picked out now spatial structures of parts of the brain that are active at the same time during sleep. The patients aren't actually doing anything, they're just asleep, right? But these are networks that are functionally connected even during sleep in this transient way that we can now pick out with a technique um, that I've just described in DMD. And these, these spindle networks, they also have um, distinct spatial structures and they also have distinct underlying carrying frequencies. I told you that the, the, these spindles are defined as, as having um, around 14 hertz oscillations, um, but it turns out that if you look really closely, they're not all 14. Some of them are more like 15 or 16, and some of them are closer down to 12. And the same ones where they, uh, the same ones where they are, um, the same ones where they're at, for example, to the front of the brain tend to be at a certain carrying frequency, and the ones at the back of the brain are at a different carrying frequency. 
Um, and the next thing we did is that we went ahead and compared these networks that we've extracted from electrode recordings and DMD and compared them to the kinds of networks that were extracted using um, functional MRI, which is a completely different technology on a different physical basis. They're now measuring blood oxygenation levels in the brain, and here we're measuring electrical activity. These are completely different. They, are on, they were done in the same patients at different times. Um, and we were able to see that there were remarkable similarities between the networks that we were able to find using um, DMD and spindle detection and these resting state networks that were found using fMRI. Um, and it kind of, I think, bolsters the case for both of them that they are coincident, that there may be something meaningful going down here, that these may be some meaningful functional networks in the brain, that these are just the brain areas that like talking to each other. Um, and so the second, and what I've been getting into more recently is the same type of data, um, these patients being monitored for, for epilepsy. Um, and somebody already asked earlier about how much data we have, and the, and the short answer is we have lots and lots of data. These people are in the hospital 24-7 for a couple of weeks, and they are, there's a video camera trained on them in, at any time, and there's also a microphone in, in the room all the time. And so what we did recently, and this is done in collaboration with Nancy Wong, who is a um, graduate student in computer science, and also done with Raj Rao, who's a, a professor in computer science, is um, we got permission to get access to this data. Uh, and so now not only do we have brain data, we have monitor data of what's actually happening in the patient's room as they're just doing stuff, right? So, so there's a lot of interesting questions to be answered here, and one of them is can this actually help us try to figure out what's going on in the brain, right? If you only try to decode brain activity in the context of uh, structured tasks, like you tell, the, you tell the patient, go grab this cup, okay, so go grab the bottle. So they grab the bottle and they just do this five times. They're concentrating, they're not doing anything else, right? Maybe you can find patterns in the brain. But what if they're doing it just because they want to and they're also talking to somebody over there and there's a TV playing over there and can you, can you still decode the same activity in this naturalistic context? And if you can't, then this is something that's not terribly useful in terms of uh, something one would deploy in the real world, right? And so we're starting to dig into this, this much richer multimodal data set, both from the perspective of can we, can we understand something about the brain and how it works in this naturalistic context, as well as can we use this extra information from the video and the audio monitoring to help our decoding of the brain, to help us figure out what the person is doing from an extra information source so that we can account for it in the neural decoding algorithms. Um, so I think, um, how am I doing on time? Okay, so um, I'll just mention briefly um, the, 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 the kind of neuroengineering part of my research, which is uh, what happens if we poke it. Um, so everything we've talked about so far has been monitoring, right? We're just, we're just kind of sitting there and we have the privilege of watching what the brain does, but really we, we can do more than that. We have technologies now where we can go in and zap the brain in various ways. We can do it electrically, we can do it magnetically, and we can do it optically. We can't do it optically in humans yet, but there's FDA trials uh, ongoing where that's probably gonna happen soon. Um, and so why do we wanna do this? Well, well, you know, I think fundamentally from the scientific perspective, one reason we wanna do it is that if you manipulate a system, you actually get the system to go into states that you may not be accessible otherwise, if you were just watching it. Um, and this is a really good way um, it's by engineering to, to understand a system. So if we want to understand the brain better, then we should be able to figure out, you know, if I push on it in certain ways, I should be able to predict what happens. And if we can do that, then I think our understanding of the brain is deeper, right? Um, and the other thing that's really exciting for me is uh, we want to do nature-inspired engineering, and we also want to use engineering principles to understand the brain. Um, and so this is another thrust of where my lab has been working. Um, and we're working, uh, under the, the sponsorship of the well, University of Washington Institute for Neuroengineering, um, which is a, um, a, set of, a set of people, some of whom are here, um, where we work on the intersection of neuroscience, computing, and devices. And this is a figure I shamelessly stole from Tom Daniel. Um, but I think it, I, I stole it because I couldn't come up with anything better, right? Like this is really what neuroengineering is all about, right? Um, and so I'll tell you very briefly about one particular flavor of what I've been working on in the context of, of this project, which is, uh, First of all, asking a very general question, which is not even, a, not even a biology question, which is given a fixed budget of sensors, where do you want to put them to optimally inform some kind of decision making, right? Um, and so, so this, is a, this is a question that is relevant for uh, sensor networks, when you want to measure something for surveillance, for example. So if you want to put buoys in the ocean, each buoy costs money to get a boat and lug it out there and then go fix it when it breaks, right? So you have a fixed budget of sensors you're able to afford, and you have a specific task, where do you put them, right? And so we worked on something together that um, 
together uh, with Steve Brunton and Nathan Coates and Josh, Josh Proctor, um, where we try to solve this problem in a principled way as an optimization question. Um, and from the biology side, this also has a, some implications for sensor networks biology because organisms have exactly the same problem, which is that they can't just grow an infinite number of sensors. They can't these, put these sensors anywhere. They can't put them one centimeter away from their body. They're constrained to their bodies. And so this is a constrained optimization question. Um, and so we had uh, some strategies for, 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 for looking at this problem. And uh, what I'm gonna try to do is skip to this part, uh, which is how we ended up writing the problem as, a, uh, as optimization. So um, what we did is uh, leverage the fact that a lot of these signals that you actually want to, want to, want to, want to categorize have some kind of low-dimensional structure. Um, and so we wrote down an optimization problem um, that leverages this structure and um, the sparsity promoting L1 norm of the sensor set that you have to try to reconstruct a discriminant space from the feature space as much as possible using as few sensors as possible. Um, and so uh, all of this is on the archive. If you care to read about it, I apologize. I don't have time to talk about it right now. Um, but I'll just show you one really cool figure that I've been able to generate, which is, I think, really cool. Um, and so I trained the algorithm to recognize faces. This is a classic thing that we all do, right? Um, and I ask it, well, if you had to tell a couple of people apart, where would you put your sensors? Where on the face would you look, right? Um, and here's what, here's what the uh, algorithm said. This is the ensemble of sparse sensor locations where every pixel, the more white it is, the more likely it is that there'll be a sensor put there. So I did this um, in a cross-validated way, so that's why it's not deterministic. And so you'll see that it's picking out, it's telling me that I should look at the, the eyes I should look at the bridge of the nose, the corners of the nose, and the corners of the mouth, okay? And it, as it happens, that's exactly where humans look, right? This is a classic result from um, Yarbus, who is a Russian scientist back in the 60s, one of the first ones to put eye trackers on humans and just have them look at pictures. And so what he found is that if you look at that figure there on the left of a, if a picture of a human face, that's what we all do on the right. Right? We spend about 90% of the time just looking at the eyes and the nose and the mouth. And that's exactly what the algorithm predicts. And so we didn't need any algorithm to tell us that. Right? We all know this is what we look at. Right? But this kind of gives me some confidence that it's picking out salient features um, that if it's a system that is not as intuitive to us as a human face, then it might be picking out something that's actually reasonable and meaningful features in the system. Um, so we've applied this to a variety of, uh, of applications. And uh, one of the ones that is, we're starting to start still working on a little bit is the, is the context of how do we understand sensor networks in animals. Um, so here we have a, a hawk moth, which is one of these little flying insects you see kind of scurrying around your light in the, in the middle of the night if you turn your lights on. And uh, they have this beautiful structure in their wings called campanulum scintilla, which are mechanoreceptors that help them inform something like you know, how bendy their wings is. It's sensitive to strain, the second derivative, the second spatial derivative, right? Um, and if you look at where they are on the, on the wing, there's not that many of them, and they are at reproducible locations. So the question is, why are they there, right? And so the classic thing that we biologists want to do to understand why they are where they are, which is I like to move one of them and see what it does, we can't do that experiment. We just don't have access to those tools. We can't just go in there and make a bunch of moths where their sensors are at slightly different locations and see how that affects the behavior, right? And so what we're really gonna do is uh, go backwards and uh, make a hypothesis, right? We're gonna make it a hypothesis that um, maybe these strain sensors on the wing detect body rotation. And if this hypothesis is true, we can then algorithmically back out where they should have been. Right? and then compare that to biology and see if we have any insights about where they are. Um, and so this is an experiment we do backwards, um, starting from numerical simulations. And then just very briefly, what we ended up finding is that if you just naively do this, it doesn't work at all, right? Like the, the, this, these sensors don't tell you about body rotation at all, and it's really terrible. But if you add back in neuronal decoding, so this is a, um, a spike triggered average in time of what activates an actual neuron on the moth's body from electrophysiological recording. If we put that back into the neurical simulation, now we can actually tell whether or not the moth's body is rotating or not. 
and it gives us sparse sensor locations on the wing, right? So this project is kind of ongoing, and um, I just really like the idea of using some of these engineering principles to inform biology. Um, and I think it also has a lot of applications uh, in the context we were talking about earlier in the previous section of the talk about brain recordings, because again, there is a, there is a case where we don't have unlimited resources for sensors, right? You can only put in so many, and even if you could put in as many as you want, maybe you have an onboard processor that can only chug through so much data at any one time, and you need to pick which subset of your electrodes you're actually, pay, you're actually going to pay attention to. Um, and so this is something that's actively going on um, in my lab right now. We're gonna try to you know, flesh out some of these ideas, both from the mathematical perspective as well as their impact to do neuroengineering. Um, so I'll end here by uh, just talking a little bit about Oliver Sacks. Okay? Oliver Sacks passed away early this year, and uh, I think I am among many probably in this audience who grew up reading Oliver Sacks. So he's the author of uh, some really popular books like The Awakening, which was made into a movie, and The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. And Oliver Sacks was a neurologist um, and an author who is tremendously influential. And I think one of the things that we can learn from Oliver Sacks is that he really valued the individual. Right? So especially in this age of big data, where we are collecting tons and tons of data from everyone and aggregating it and you know, having all of these big data problems, I think it's really important to remember that even if you look at these distributions of humanity, that um, you know, you know, like the, the noise in the system, right? the, the noise in the distribution, that's, that's the difference between me and Andy. Right? And that's, that's an important difference. That's not just noise in my data, that's a really important difference. And so I think uh, we, should, we should remember that in this, in this age of big data and trying to study the brain to not lose track of our humanity. Thank you. We can take two questions. Yes. Uh, as I understand, you mentioned that uh, the fMRI or functional near infrared microscopy is giving similar information as what you would get from e uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Um, fMRI is giving the same functional information as the ECOG? It's not giving the same functional information. It's finding some of the same functional networks. And by network, I mean a set of brain areas that are connected to each other and seem to be working together. So the question is, in the future, can ECOG be replaced at fMRI? Um, no, probably not, because they give you very different information at different temporal scales. fMRI tend to give you one sample every couple of seconds, whereas ECOG, like I said, is operating more like a couple of, you know, 100 or for two, kil two kilohertz or something like that. So they're going to give you very different information. They're measuring fundamentally different physical underlying um, processes. Um, but of course, fMRI would do a lot of it because we, we can, it's non-invasive. But they don't give you this information. We can take one more question if you have. Okay, if not, let's thank Bing for an excellent talk.